The most expensive bottle of wine you've ever sold? The most expensive bottle of wine I ever sold was uh, 60,000 pounds. It was a uh, Le Roi Musini 2005. Le Roi is, uh, is, is a terrific, Domaine Le Roi is a terrific um, producer in Burgundy. Pinot Noir, of course. For some reason or another, everyone thinks they're doing a great deal by buying the second cheapest wine on the menu. Everyone does that. They're like, I'm not going to go for the cheapest, but the second cheapest must be the best choice. Every restaurant knows this. <laughs> Therefore, it is the wine with the biggest markup on every single wine list. It's the second cheapest. So if you want to go for the cheapest, go for the cheapest. If you want to have a better deal, go for the third cheapest. A lot of people want to buy fine wine. They don't really know where to start. They don't know really what the value is of these products once they've bought them. And they don't know really how to store them, which seems to be a pretty important thing in this industry. And I said, you know, it would be great if we start a business where we've just made it extremely simple for people to get help in terms of discovering what wines to buy and storing them in the proper way, getting a really easy view on what the value is of these products at any given time. And that's how we kicked it off. Well, this talk about wine, I think we should probably crack these I ones I was waiting open. for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, Let's do it. I really enjoyed these bottles of wine. I think I might have enjoyed them too much. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get a lift home if, if one of you boys can drop me off. Hello and welcome to the GV London podcast. And today we're talking about the world of fine wine. I've got my good friend Greg Swartberg on and he started a business 10 years ago that specializes in buying and selling fine wine. He sells hundreds of thousands of bottles of wine every single year. He's going to be telling us everything about the right wine to invest in, crazy wine collections, up to 60 million, just one guy owning one collection and just crazy stories about fake bottles of wine in the industry. Now guys, before we go on, I'd like to take a moment to tell you that today's sponsor is Howden's Insurance Group. I can't stress how important it is for a business owner to have the right insurance broker alongside them, uh, especially a business owner that is in the motor trade industry. Especially with the increase in crime in the UK, it's never been more important to choose the right insurance broker. And I personally believe that Howden's have been absolutely excellent. Howden's don't only cover car insurance, they actually cover many different insurance products across different sectors. They've been running for around 30 years and very well respected in the industry. We get customers from all walks of life here at GVE and there can be a customer that needs to get one car insured or sometimes there's customers that have car collections of 10, 20, 30 cars and we have no hesitation in putting them forward. So guys, if you find yourself in need of some insurance, check out the link in the description below and I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. So Greg, tell us a little bit more about Crew Wine. So uh, Crew Wine started 10 years ago. I uh, found the business with a co-founder, also Dutch like myself. And uh, we really started the business with the view to help private clients collect, buy the rarest bottles of wine in the world. That's how we started off. Um, and as you know from starting a business, <laughs> it was quite tricky in the beginning. Uh, but we, we built the business up to where we are today. And, and uh, where, where is that? So uh, what, what's the revenue like at this point in time? So we're working towards 20 million a, a year. 20 Sterling. million a year. The, um, and uh, how many bottles of wine does that equate to? Um, we would go into in the hundreds of thousands. Um, wow. So, so you, yeah, you'd look at our warehouse, which is bigger than this one. No way. And, uh, <laughs> just filled with wine, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And um, so you said you started it 10 years ago. Did you always have a passion before you started uh, the business about wine? Yeah. Um, so that's quite, f uh, I'll tell you how I started with it. So when I was young, uh, 17, I went into my father's cellar and, um, and I looked at the wines and I thought, all right, I shouldn't choose any, select any wine, it's too expensive. So I found one which um, I grew up in France, and um, what's called Chateau Mouton Rothschild. Um, but at the time, I didn't know what that meant, or what it was. But Mouton in French means sheep. So I thought to myself, Chateau sheep, this, gotta be, this has got to be cheap stuff, so I can open that. Yeah. And uh, so I opened up with my buddies who all knew nothing about wine, just like myself. And, and it was spectacular. It really? Was really, I remember to this day, it was spectacular. Well, how old were you? 17. 17 uh, years yeah, old? Maybe 16. Okay. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have opened that. But surely, surely in France, all the kids start drinking quite early. Yeah. Like wine, wine surely isn't. Yeah, wine was water at 14 maybe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, 
and it was amazing. And and, I, and and that day kind of it started for me to remember that uh, it, it you know it's such it's something really nice. It's a product I liked. I had I, curiosity was kind of developed then, um, and then I started my career in strategy consultancy and all these kind of things, which which was relatively boring, you could say. Um, and then with my buddy, we were like, look, a lot of people want to buy fine wine. Uh, they don't really know where to start. Um, they don't know really what the value is of these products once they've bought them. And they don't know really how to store them, which seems to be a pretty important thing in this industry. Um, and I said, you know, it would be great if we started a business where we've just made it extremely simple for people to get help in terms of discovering what wines to buy and storing them in a, in, in, in a in a proper way, getting a really easy view on, on, on what the value is of these products at any given time, and then just be able to sell them as well if they wanted to without having to find out, you know, through auctions and various other ways how to sell these products. Uh, and that's how we kicked it off. So we started with, like, if, you know, a few friends, like I get most business start, to, to thousands and thousands of clients nowadays. Really? Yeah. So I'm guessing when you started... There weren't many other people doing the same thing, or there were, but they'd done it in a more traditional way, and you've brought a more new age uh, yeah. uh, uh, twist to the business? Yeah, you're, you're spot on, that's right. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, we still have those competitors who've been around for 250 years, um, but they do it very traditionally. You call up, or you, you email, and you buy some products, and you kind of almost have to keep a tab at home as to what you have. And this mm -hmm. sort of digital approach was, 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 was very new at least ten years ago, where... You'd log in online, you'll see all your history, all your products you have. You could click a button, sell it. I mean, it's really interactive. Wow. Way so, of dealing with a collection. Say, say, for example, I bought a case of wine from yourself. Yeah. Then I could log on to your system. Yeah. See that I bought it, you know, a see year See where ago. it is in the world at this moment, because it could be in transit ah, as okay. well. So, so I, I've, I've ordered it from you. Yeah. It's in transit. Yeah. It's coming from Argentina, let's say, for example, yeah. right? And um, but then once I receive it, and two years later, I can log on to my system and then say, "Greg, do you want to buy my crate yeah. of wine from Argentina?" Yeah, because it's gone up in value. Yeah, y and you can even go further. You might have three cases. You say, "I want to have two bottles delivered, and I want to sell the rest," or "I want to buy. I want to get one case delivered. I want to sell the other two. And we can even go further, where you say, "Actually, I'd like to trade it with someone." So you swap a bottle for a bottle. So it doesn't even have to land on your doorstep? No, we keep everything in big warehouses like these. We've got three throughout Europe. There's one in Italy, one in France, one in the UK. Wow. And, um, it's, and, and it's a very important point here because um, I think it's very similar to, to supercars. The, the history of how a, the product has been kept. Or in this, so for us, it's actually where it has been stored, the humidity levels, all these things, when it was transported, was it transported in summer, yes or no, all these factors determine the value of the product because the product is alive. Supercar, same. How, who owned it? Was it maintained? Yes or no? Uh, my knowledge of supercars is, a, is obviously more based on no, yours. No, no, I get it. Provenance, but, right? But the provenance yeah. of, of it is super important. So actually storing it in professional warehouses like ours yeah. keeps the value or ensures that the, the, the product is kept uh, in its best conditions, which therefore maximize the value of it. So is there ever a case where somebody buys a... I don't know, like a 30-year-old bottle of wine and then, um, and then they open it and it's because it's not been stored right, like, I don't know, it, what's the terminology? It's been corked. Yeah. And then suddenly it tastes like vinegar and you're yeah. like, oh, God. And it's horrible, right? Because yeah. you're, <laughs> you're looking forward to it. Yeah. And then you open it up and it's horrible, yeah. And we can often look, just look at the bottle. We can already see if it's... How? Uh, what we call unconditioned. One of the... the, the the, the fact is, is, is it could be corked, uh, but um, how is um, the cork? So if you if you keep a bottle vertically, that's a very basic thing. It's yeah. very important for anyone store collecting wine. Always store it horizontally. Okay. And the reason why is because it keeps the cork humid. Uh, okay. And if it's vertical and it's kept dry and then you turn around again, then yeah. some of the wines can go through and therefore you can see it on the capsule that wine has gone through the cork and therefore most likely the wine is unconditioned. Oh, no. So just looking at the bottle, you can sometimes see it. You don't even have to open the cork. So um, when you lay the bottle hor horizontally, right, um, is there also another thing where you have to then turn the bottle slowly or something like that? Is yeah. that right? Yeah, well, you, got, you, you know you, got, you know you want. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it helps as well to turn it around a little bit. Really? Um, 
in, in, to the extent that, yeah, if you, store, if you store in a certain way that is not liquid all the way to the cork, then, yeah, uh, it helps. Also in Champagne, they do it a lot for the aging process, oh which wow. is probably where you might have seen it as well. Um, but it, it's less important than the fact of just having it horizontally and vertically. The, the, the most important is to store it horizontally. Horizontal. And also it's about the, the humidity so, um, and, and the temperature. So if you, if you put a bottle of wine for three hours in the summer in the sun, you can already almost say that it's cooked. Um, and and so it's it's a lot of clients would say oh how was this one was this wine transported in the summer yes or no and if it has people don't want to buy it oh really yeah so it can't be too hot uh, hence the reason why people have cellars yeah which is always cool I guess that's from back in the day but when air conditioning wasn't around yeah that the coolest part of the house would be a cellar right yeah correct okay fine and um, but but just to to add something to it um, you, you don't have to have these facilities at home. You can also store your, your, your wines that you like and collect them with companies like ours. Keep the wines in storage with us. You pay an annual fee, of course. And you go online, you click a button, you say, I want that wine delivered to my door tomorrow. And you have it anywhere in the country, next day delivered to your home. No so you don't way. necessarily have to build all these facilities at home. People like to because they can show uh, their, their products to their friends and, and I guess they can be more spontaneous the evening of, of yeah. picking a bottle out yeah. but you don't have to actually most people keep it in storage with us well, I, can't, I can't imagine a lot of places in London have that those facilities right yeah. especially with space being so limited but uh, I've, I've seen how efficient your service was uh, because uh, when, when we kind of suggested the idea that you might you should bring a couple of bottles of, uh, bottles of wine yesterday he said, "Ah, oh, that's a good idea." And literally, they're here, you know, next day before three o'clock. It's brilliant. Yeah, you said thirty, and I think I've, we've got a bottle of ninety-six, so almost thirty years of age. So, oh my god, we'll, we'll test it. Maybe, maybe it will be corked. I don't know. So I that's don't think amazing. So, but uh, yeah, I, I've been drinking wine since I was um, probably the French legal limit, um, <laughs> 16, 15, 16. and back in the day, it was um, the reason why I started drinking wine. Was firstly because I saw my mom and dad drinking it, yeah, and it was perceived to be the healthier option if you are going to drink drink yep. wine, right? Um, and actually, I think from my dad's perspective as well, he uh, he thought, okay, well, look, you're going to go out and you're going to drink with your friends anyway, so if you are going to drink something, wine seems like the sensible option. Yeah, fine. So he's okay with that. And then uh, then it was just having friends around, and back in the day, it was like. Well, the other factor you have to consider when you don't have much money, when you're a youngster, is, uh, okay, you can buy a bottle, or a nice bottle of red for, you know, back in those days, because I'm getting on a bit now, it was five, six pounds or seven pounds, yeah. which is the equivalent of a 20 pound bottle today. But ever since that, uh, then, I've just absolutely loved my wines. But I, I, I really love the concept of investing in wines, but I've, I, I find it hard to get my head around, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I, a funny story somebody told me when I used to go to Thailand a lot. That's where I'd done a lot of business and that's where I started this business. Um, and a funny story that somebody told me in the hotel that I always used to stay in. He's the head of uh, food and beverage. And um, he said, you won't believe the amount of Chinese clients we get coming here. Uh, we actually go out prospecting in Shanghai and Beijing and whatever to get them to come and stay in our hotel because we know how much they're going to spend on wine, right? And uh, he said, um, you know, they're sitting around a big table and one friend will put his hand up and say, I'm going to buy, you know, a 5,000 pound bottle of wine. And then the other will say, I'm going to buy a 10 or 15, whatever, right? And he goes, the craziest thing, you won't believe it. But some of, the, some of them open the bottle, put it in, and then top it up with some Coca-Cola. Right. I'm not joking. Yeah. Have you heard of that before? Yeah, I've heard of it and I've even seen it. Yeah. No yeah. way. Yeah. When you see that, do, does your mind start going mad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the honest truth is yes. I mean, ultimately, people, I guess, enjoy them however they want. But yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, yeah it's, it's rarely seen yeah. uh, outside of maybe that area who some people enjoy it with, with Coca-Cola, <laughs> which, is, which is a little bit, uh, yeah, it's a little bit 
different, let's say. But that's crazy. Some people I've seen them. They buy a bottle of Petrus for five k, put them in the fridge, you know, and oh. and they just take them out the fridge. You say, well, why are you keeping that way? You don't ask questions, but you you just observe and you say, well, that's a bit of an odd way of of you know, you know serving your wines. And and yeah, and some people, you know, I've been to that part of the world many times. You know, whether it's Hong Kong, Singapore, Seoul, all of those places out there, because we have you know clients from 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 that region as well collecting with us, and. Um, and, and, and they would, you know, 35 degrees summer bottle of red wine. Some of them, they just refuse to drink white wine. It's just red wine all the time. And, and, and so, yeah, people drink their wines differently, you know, in different parts of the world. In, in the U.S., for example, it's only about good vintages. They will never touch anything that is not a good vintage. Really? Yeah, for, uh, not, of, of course, every American, but yeah, just but as, as, as... When, so if when they're buying to, at that level, yeah, yeah. it's all about the vintages. Yeah. And then some of them will say, we don't touch in champagne. Champagne is, you know, uh, wow. it's a, we're just red wine. So, so, you know, every part of the world has a kind of different... Uh, well, it's interesting they say that because I think I've been to a few places in Italy now uh, where Italy and Spain, where they like putting their uh, red wine in the fridge and yeah. then it comes out cold. Have you seen that before? Yeah, so I've seen it, but it's uh, it's yeah, it's a little bit uh, yeah, it's it's not the right way of storing your wines or yeah. keeping your wine. So so the red wine is twelve to fourteen degrees. Okay, that's how you should store it, and it's actually how you should serve it. Twelve might be a little bit on the cold side, but that's roughly where you. So it should be a little bit cold. Fourteen degrees is, is, is cold. Mm-hmm. Champagne is seven to nine. You know, so you got like these specific degrees which are optimum for wine. Oh, wow. But a fridge is like four five degrees, so it, it's yeah. really much colder than it should be for red wine. Yeah, well. All this talk about wine, I think we should probably crack these I ones open. I was waiting open. for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, Let's do it. Okay, terrific. I think you'll be the master in opening it. I, I know what I'll do. Yeah, under all this it. pressure. <laughs> no, no, under all this pressure, the cork will go in straight inside or something like that. Do you know, uh, do you do you always have your red with um, with like cheese or something like that? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, cheese is great for red wine, but so is white wine. Yeah. So it's sweet white wine as well. The art of uh, food and, and, and wine pairing is one of the big, most important job actually of a sommelier to be able to identify what wine uh, would go well with what kind of food. Uh, and the reason for it is because you have some light wines and then you have some very <laughs> spicy foods, let's say. And then if, if, if you were to drink the wine, then... Um, the, the food just takes over the taste. Yeah, the food yeah. takes over the, the taste of the wine. Thirty-year-old bottle, huh? Wow. Try to um, so there, f- there are four steps to um, tasting to trying wine. The first one is the color. So so if it's if it's all the t- it tends to turn to brown. So you can see it's a little bit more brownish. The second one is on the nose without swirling. Second one is swirling. What it does is it opens up the wine. Superb. Really? You didn't need to let it breathe or anything like that. Oh, that's going to be beautiful. <laughs> You're going to enjoy that. And do you know, to tell if it's been corked, do you have to, uh, can you also tell from yes. the actual cork itself? Right? Yeah, so it's, so it's a scientific reaction essentially from the cork. Uh, and there's nothing you can essentially do about it. It's one out of 200. Um, one out of 200 yeah. bottles inevitably yeah. will be get corked. corked. Yeah. Okay. That happens in the, it's a reaction from the cork. Um, and, and therefore, yeah, it just it's like a, what they say, um, carton box. It's got that carton box taste to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've had wine like that yeah, before. Yeah, me yeah. too. Too many times, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but actually, a lot of people don't realize that when they go to a restaurant and um, when they're told, would you like to try the wine? <laughs> it's not to actually just try the wine and see if they like it. It's just to be able to tell if the bo- bottle was corked or not. Yes. Right? And so then what are the key things that they should be looking out for when um, a sommelier brings some wine and says, would you like to try the wine? Um, I think the, the most important is to see if you like it. Um, and after having tried thousands of wines, it's also about trying to remember if, if, if it tastes like it should. So s- sometimes... Um, what happens is the wine can be oxidized, meaning there's too much oxygen that went into the wine and therefore it just didn't age well. You will not have that cotton box feeling, but you might not have the aromas that you're supposed to get. It, oh, superb. 
<laughs> just have two amazing can, can, wines here. Can I, I get two glasses for me? The selection of the team has just been <laughs> too good. Can two, we have two more glasses? Yeah, please. please. Oh, you're going to love these. Um, you're going to love these. I think um, I've never been so excited on a podcast before. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're here to enjoy ourselves. So let's, let's do something fun. That's perfect. Um, That's great. Try to... So try to just look at the color of the two uh, wines. Okay, so and, if it, so... and the way to look at it is often on something white. On something white, okay. The iPad's quite white, yeah. And then if you take the other one, the other glass, or the other glass, yeah. if possible. Okay, just give me a sec. I'm going to move this here, yeah. And... Oh, this is a lot darker, right? Right. Yeah. Now, on the base of having the knowledge that as a wine ages, yeah. um, it, it, it becomes more brown. So when it starts, it's a bit ruby, and then it, when it gets older, it gets brown. Okay. You can just buy the color, say that, know that one of the wines is older than the other. Okay, fine. So the darker it is, means the more aged it is. It, so the more brown it is, okay. the more old it is, the okay. more red it is, the younger it is. Ah, Okay, fine. So, which one should I uh, try first? The, the more brown or the more red? I think the, the younger wine. The so younger, the which is wine. more red. Yes, okay. correct. Okay. And I will, I will join you in that, re in, in that regard because I had the other one. All right, cheers. And we'll, we'll try it together. Cheers. Um, now, this is a wine. Um, do, we, do you want to say a few words about the wine? Or okay. We can move on to something else. It's fine. No, no, no. I want to. I want to. Uh, let me try some first. Oh, it smells lovely, huh? If you ask me what, what uh, flavors can you taste? Yes. You All taste, I know... Taste wine. <laughs> I can taste wine and yeah. it tastes good. And that's I really like most it. Important. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, it is the most important. Um, now, you could think about... Um, do you think it, it, it tastes more like black currant? Or do you feel that it tastes more like strawberry? Um, I would say more black currant. Black currant. Well, it's exactly the definition of a Bordeaux wine. Really, is, is black currant a little bit more darker fruit? So it's it's you know exactly the wine. Uh, okay. It's just that I guess I've built up the knowledge <laughs> of defining all these flavors. Okay. Um, so, but you're spot on. It's exactly how you would define a, a Bordeaux blend or Bordeaux wine. It's, it's one of the key characteristics is a bit more darker fruit. More darker fruits. Yeah. And then, is there any other thing that you're picking up in this? God, the smell's lovely. Oh, it is a really good wine. Mm, can you get a little bit of the chocolate side? I get it. A little bit chocolate, dark chocolate. Very nice. And, it, and also, it's like, the wine is, is maybe, you know, is, is, is with you for like five, six seconds. So you, you kind of get different aromas throughout the process of smelling it and, 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 and tasting it. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a, a wine we love in the business. And, and as you said, this, this we, so we bought this from the Chateau. Okay. And our company would have um, centralized, consolidated all our purchases around Bordeaux. This is a Bordeaux wine in our Bordeaux warehouse. And then it would have gone through uh, in transit through consignment to, to our UK warehouse. It would have been stored there for a few years. And, and then, as you said, we did, made decision yesterday, 11 a.m., said, oh, we should get some wines. And then today, you know, at 1 p.m., it's at your, full, at your doorstep. That's uh, great. And, and that's really great. It's this sort of... And so, obviously, our clients have this digital uh, <laughs> ability to control their collections within a, within a click of a button. And, and that's really great. And that's what sets us apart from our competitors, um, is the ability to give control to our client base uh, on, on their collections. And so this is a Bordeaux wine. This one is a younger one. Yes. So this is how old? This one is nine years of age. Okay. And um, what, what type of grape is it? Um, so in Bordeaux, you have t typically blends. Yeah. Okay, and the fine. dominant blend grape is Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. Um, the, the second dominant grape there is called Merlot. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, a little bit of... Petit Verdot and Cabernet Franc, which can make up... Cabernet Franc can, is the third dominant one, and then you have Petit Verdot as well. Wow. Th and this one will be a blend. So they blend all of those into one, right? Yeah, and with, with, uh, yeah exactly right. Um, 
How much would something like this cost? So this one would be about hundred pounds, I would say. Okay, and then um, was this particular vintage, uh, you know, quite special? Yeah. So from an investment perspective, this one is is great because this really? is uh, what we would call an undervalued uh, vintage. So if you look at the score that critic scores give to this particular vintage in the price, it is significantly underpriced given its quality versus other vintages who have um, a higher score. And um, 2014 is, for example, vintage. If you wanted to collect wine and make money from it too, it's a vintage you should be buying today. Okay, so this compared to other vintages is undervalued at £100 a bottle, right? Yeah. So now in your experience, I'm, I'm not holding you to it, right? Something like this, in, oh, actually, I guess the question is, when is the ideal time to drink it? So nine years ago, this wine was made. Yeah. When is the optimal time to drink? I think it started two years ago. Okay, fine. And it will go on for the next 30 years, probably. 25 no years. No way. Yes. So, so it's stays. got like a, probably a 30-year window to drink. That's fantastic, right? Yeah. And so from 100, 100 pound, in five years' time, what do you see this being at? It could be 150 to 175. Okay. And then let's say, how many bottles do you actually store of this su such that somebody, if he wanted to um, have it as an investment, like it'd probably have to buy a few bottles, right? Yeah. Typically, you, 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 um, you invest in different regions, different vintage. You, uh, some people go all in on one wine. Really? Uh, but most people go in. Diversify, just like in, 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 in the, with their shares. They diversify their holdings in wine. Yeah. Uh, and and what are the most popular regions? Like, I guess Bordeaux is number one. Yeah. Bord Bordeaux, Burgundy, Italy, Champagne. Top four vintages. In Italy, you have Piemonte, Tuscany. Yeah. And then you have uh, California as well. Okay. Um, the in, Napa Valley. In the New World. Napa Valley, yeah. that's right. Uh, but in terms of, of serious investment grade regions, it's Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, Tuscany, oh. Piemonte, Napa Valley. And then you can go for the one-off in various different other regions. But those are the serious uh, at scale. And, and in value, I mean, you know, millions and millions and billions come out of these regions on an annual basis. Really? Yeah. And um, what are the up-and-coming kind of wine regions? I know uh, there's a very unusual um, wine that I like, and I, I discovered it through, you know, one of these um, wine merchants on the high street. But it was... Um, uh, Chateau Moussa from Lebanon. Yeah. And I, yeah, I've never tasted a wine like that before. It's just yeah. so great. Yeah. It's actually the only wine from Lebanon, which is really quite, uh, you could say, global now. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of regions now, it's Tuscany. Tuscany, really? yeah, is the real region which is booming. Uh, and, and, and it's completely underpriced versus other regions. No, it's not to say that other regions are overpriced, but, but Tuscany, is, is, I think, is the, offers the best value for money at the moment. Any other regions after Tuscany? I think, you know, the um, Burgundy, you could say, it fell off a little bit, you know, recently of, of its high, and it's now, there's a lot of bargains. Oh, really? Uh, so, so if anything, you know... So, i.e., this bottle, 100 pounds, you know, maybe... Ten, five years, ten years ago, it would have been more. So, no, it's just two years ago. Oh. We had a crazy kind of uh, spike uh. up, and it kind of adjusted a little bit. It adjusted, so okay. It, right now, it's a buyer's market. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, it's a buyer's market at the moment, too. Oh, I, I was, I'm guessing two years ago, it was a seller's market. Yeah, that's right. We saw it with cars. We've had people on about their watch, you know, watch companies. We've had, you know, all sorts of different companies come on this podcast, and everybody said the same thing. Two years ago... It was absolutely a seller's market. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how times have changed, right? Yeah. I mean, you could sell a product 10% above market price two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Because 100%. people were wanting to buy it yeah. and, 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 and they were fighting to buy it. And now you could buy products 10% on the market, 5% on the market. Why? Because some people want to sell and money and, and those who have cash, they're, they're really benefiting it from it at the moment. That's unbelievable. Um, I'm looking forward to trying the... The Next bottle of wine. Terrific. Okay, so this is the 30-year-old. Yep. James, 
you know what? I think I might have some parmesan in my uh, in the fridge upstairs. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to have some? That would be great. Yeah. It's definitely in date. I promise. Um, but I want to know why does wine always taste better when you've had some cheese? <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, you know how with white wine, it's a little bit more the case. When you move it around, you have this acidity in it. You kind of have this mouth-watering effect. And I think with food, uh, th the same happens. It get, like an animal instinct almost. You see food, you get this mouth-watering instinct. And because you get the, the, the food and you pair the wine, and it just gets this sort of beautiful mixture of aromas in your mouth, and it just makes everything better. And a lot of wines actually taste better when you have them with food. A lot of wines are also nice without food, of course. But yeah, when you have cheese, it, it, it's something about cheese, <laughs> which <laughs> I also love, which is the fact that, yeah, it's it just brilliant. Pa it, it pairs really nicely together. Um, it, it is great. Actually, uh, James, can we get two little plates and then we can ha have it on our, the, the, the side table? Please, thank you. So that's interesting about the cheese. I don't know, it, it kind of dries my mouth out and then I have the wine and yeah. it's, it's, it's like quenching my thirst, right? Yeah. The other one is um, steaks. Yeah. So I read somewhere that actually having a glass of wine with a, a, a steak is actually quite good because there's some enzymes that help in the wine that help the steak break down. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I've heard of that before. Yeah, absolutely yeah. spot on, yeah. And, um, it, it, you know, marrying a, a steak with red wine, I mean, it's fantastic. We all know it. But oh, really? I've never tried no, that. No, no, sorry, I meant, I meant marrying. Oh, uh, okay, uh, marrying, yeah, um, okay. Fine, I thought you said marinating. Yeah. And, uh, but also marinating. <laughs> Both are good. <laughs> that would be quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, you're spot on in terms of... Um, pairing uh, it. D d pairing it together with red wine. But if you, for example, had a very spicy black pepper sauce that you put with a steak and then you put a Pinot Noir which uh, I believe you quite enjoy sometimes yeah. then the wine might not always be as strong to actually balance with the very strong aromas that you will feel in, in, in your mouth from the, the, the spiciness of the black pepper okay. so marrying the, so, so combining um, or pairing is the better word yeah. pairing the food with the right wine is, 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 is genuinely art. Uh, that's why so many years have, have a great job. Yeah. And, uh, and it really makes the evening better or sometimes complete, uh, completely ruins an evening. And, and that's why it's always great to ask sommeliers for help uh, yeah. because although most of the time they try to sell you some of the expensive stuff, right. they, they know what they're doing. And, 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 and it's a big part of the evening is well, that, to select the right wines. I've got a funny uh, story about a sommelier and um, me and my friend who's actually in the same chapter of YPO that we're in. Yes. So actually that's one thing that we've not mentioned, that we're both in uh, a director's forum together, uh, a, a, an organisation called Young Pe President's Organisation. And um, what a great organisation that is, by the way. Yeah, terrific. But um, so m my friend and I, we were out and we were having a steak in a nice place in Park Lane. And... Um, and exactly the same thing. I, I need as much help as possible. I don't profess to know anything about wine other than a few names, right? And the fact that something tastes like blackcurrant. But uh, I, I said to the sommelier, look, I need some help. This is the kind of uh, food that we're going to go for tonight. I need some help with it. Yeah. So he says, oh, I've got the perfect wine for you. And it's got this aroma. This is what it, it tastes like and all of that stuff, right? And so I was like, oh my God, this guy's spoken so passionately about this wine. We have to go for it, right? Yeah. I look at my friend, he gives me the nod and I'm like, okay, cool. Off he walks. And then my friend says, one second, we didn't ask him for the price. So I said, hey, hey, come back for one second, right? I had to actually run up to him because he uh, yeah. started processing it in the, the till. And uh, he comes back to the table and I said, oh, how much is the wine you never told us? He said, oh, oh okay, I, f I forgot, um, 1,900 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Cheeky. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah so you're I'm right. happily married with kids, but if I was on a date, right, yeah. and I'd done that, yeah. how embarrassing would well, that be to be like, uh, Depends on the ending, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you something else. I want to add something else, actually. It's um, the famous story of the second cheapest bottle of wine on the menu. For some reason or other, everyone thinks they're doing a great deal, 
by buying the second cheapest wine on the menu. Everyone does that. They're like, I'm not going to go for the cheapest, but the second cheapest must be the best choice. Mm. Every restaurant knows this. <laughs> Therefore, it is the wine with the biggest markup on every single wine list. It's the second cheapest. So if you want to go for the cheapest, go for the cheapest. If you want to have a better deal, go for the third cheapest. Never what? go for the second cheapest. But it's, it's an international thing that people do. They go to look at the wine list and they say, I don't want to, I, I'm probably going to have a good deal by going for the second cheapest, but it's actually the worst deal you can go for. So I, um, I have a bit of a stigma attached to saying house. I'll go for the house wine. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I don't know, n notoriously, like, house means you're going for whatever. Yeah. Right? The house red. Yeah. And what's your views on it? I love it. Really? I love the house red, yeah. It's the owner or someone who knows about wine. They went out of their way to select that particular wine as being the house wine. And yeah. it, it generally often is uh, a, a pretty decent wine. Um, only one I would stay off is the house white wine. I think oh, really? the house rosé, I grew up in South France, you know, I love rosé. Um, but the house red is typically good. House white is, can be a little bit off sometimes. Yeah, but uh, it, it's, it's a really good choice. I, and I often take it myself too. And, and, f and frankly, it's probably the wine that the, or the institution spent the most time uh, in selecting is their house wine. Wow. So it's not a bad choice. The bad choice okay. is the second cheapest wine. <laughs> <laughs> I, th that is some really useful information, actually. Um, okay, this wine, the 30-year-old Bordeaux as well. Bordeaux. Um, it's brown in color. I see that. Um, the smell. Don't smells like a nice red wine. Yeah. <laughs> That's about no, it's, it's a superb wine. To get to give a little bit of help in terms of not not help, but just in terms of context, what happens when a wine ages is that um, you get something called tertiary aromas. So the primary aromas is the fruit. So the younger wine, the more the fruit, you have a ex fruit explosion almost in your yeah. mouth. And the older the wine, the older the primary aromas, so the fruits turn into tertiary aromas. Tertiary aromas is like mushroom, forest floor, those kind of walnuts, those kind of aromas. And so opening up the wine at the right time means you have the perfect balance with a little bit of that age effect on the wine and, and also the primary aromas. Also what happens is the tannins, which is a little bit that rustic feeling you can have around your teeth, uh, which you have from coffee as well, or tea, that kind of um, mm. dies off. So, so this has high tannins because it's, am I right? Uh, th this one, yeah. So this one would have had high tannins and they've now softened. Oh, they've softened. And, so, and, and okay. you're right in saying that this one would have had to have high tannins because you cannot age well if you don't have a good, oh. uh, um, you, what we call, you don't have the legs to all the way to go all the way, let's say. So, so this wine had the legs to go all the way because it's 30 year old and I mean, it's, it's perfect. You could drink it for another 10 years. Um, and, and we love this wine. It's called Calon Ségur, uh, 1996. From Bordeaux. From Bordeaux. And 1996, which, again, was a good vintage? Yeah, good vintage. And, um, and I'm guessing at this age, it's just the right time to drink it. Oh, it's perfect right now. I, I wouldn't wait longer. Okay. So, so, the, but, but some people like their wines in the 1970s. I mean, there's some wine. There are people who open wine from 1921. It's, it's a... It's a Oh, okay, Fantastic I need to ask you about that because uh, huh? that's crazy. Okay, actually, that's crazy on so many different levels, right? But I, I think that the craziest thing about it is it's like a time capsule. Yeah. Imagine everything that was going on in 1921 and suddenly somebody gives you a bottle and says, this wine has been put into a bottle and you can enjoy something that, you know, some of the, the, the most remarkable people in, in the yeah. world, uh, in, in the history of the earth, right, were having at the same time yeah. in 1921. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And frankly, it's why the value of these products go up is because of supply demand. Over time, there's less supply and a bigger group of people want to experience something. And if, therefore, that's why ultimately the, 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 the price goes up. And I guess it's very similar to supercars, that over time they can go up in value as well because there's less of less of them available. You cannot produce them again because the vintage is finished. Yeah. You cannot re -go, go to the same vintage again. And, and people love to collect these things. And, and that's why well, typically, not, all, not every single year, things go through cycles like every other product, but typically those, those wines go up in value. So this one, this, this Canon Segur 1996, would have, it's now today probably valued at 175 pounds roughly. Okay. 
Yeah. Probably came out at 15 pounds. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's crazy, huh? What a great investment then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it, <laughs> and it tastes good. So. Yeah, it tastes but yeah, no, bloody it's, amazing. It's, it's, uh, obviously, uh, yeah. And, but you say 175 pounds, but actually the taste of it, I guess. Yeah, in a restaurant, it would be 450 or 500. Easily, right? Oh, yeah. Depends where you go. Some of these Mayfair ones would sell it for 1,000. Really? But yeah, no, the, this is the, the buying it a co- through a company of ours who's a specialist and has relationships in Bordeaux to, you know. But um, in, in a restaurant, it would easily be 500, yeah. I've got to say, this is probably the best wine I've ever had. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Really glad to hear that. Well, um, I'm sure we'll follow up with some offers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is unbelievable. Um, yeah. You know, uh, on the point of um, sommeliers, it's not, uh, it's not something that you just learn for a year and then suddenly you're done. Yeah. How long does it take? I th- it takes several years. Really? Uh, yeah. And you, and you, of studying and also just trying wines, you know, recognizing how wine tastes, how wine should taste. Um, the, the professional, sorry, the amateur can pick out one out of 200 bottles roughly that is um, not right. And a professional can pick out one out of 20 bottles. Uh, that, wow. that is not right because there will d- be different levels of uh, how, how unconditioned a wine is let's say but um, but yeah no it's a tough job and it's definitely a, a, a job to be to respect because um, it, it, they do it by passion it is definitely a passion industry and and being able to share a nice bottle with someone who, who also appreciates is, is, is always great and mm. you know we, we have the most amazing dinners for our clients of course and I, uh, I can imagine and uh, we, we're gonna have to bring you to one of those oh, dinners please. as well <laughs> I'm, I'm there and, uh, and I'll change all my plans <laughs> <laughs> and yeah it is really great it's it's a really fantastic you know our client base love wine and it's, it's always great to to share that those experience with them but you know those that love it I mean some of them fly out you know PJ to to Bordeaux and Chopping, you know, from Saint Emilion to Margot to Saint Estef to try wines. I mean, it's some people. It's their. It's yeah. It's what they love most outside of work, uh, and some people like myself wow. make it their work. But wow. <laughs> it's 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 a fantastic industry. And, and and how about English wine now? Because um, I'm not sure if you came on this uh, event for YPO, but um, they had us uh, go to an English vineyard. Uh, that was producing sparkling white English wine. Yes. And I actually had one the other day, which was a demi-sec, yes. a sparkling English white wine. Yes. I can't remember the name, but uh, it was on the sweeter side, but fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. Well, what's your thoughts on the English yeah. produce? I, yeah, yeah, the English, <laughs> the English stuff. Um Look, I think it has to be respected uh, in terms of um, it, it. It needs to be respected in terms of it, the, the product they make, which is English, particularly English sparkling wine. It's actually the only premium product made, if you could say. Um, it is really good quality. A lot of blind really? tastings are happening between English sparkling wines and champagne, and and, and blindly people are trying them and are putting the English sparkling wine sometimes at the top. Um, really, and, and, and the reason for it is really climate change. And you have the biggest champagne houses buying land in no way. Sussex and in and, 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 and West Sussex and in other parts of the southern part of England where the soil is amazing and the climate is adjusting and making it, you know, a better climate, let's say now for grapes. And they're starting to make really serious, nice wine. The the problem is that LVMH that would be buying Yeah, land. in this in this situation it's uh Titanger, um so not yet LVMH. Um but but they will undoubtedly at some point soon buy buy some as well. Wow. But but this country makes wine, but within the wine space, it's really um, sparkling wine, which is the, the the one that stands out as really high quality. And and the labor cost is high in this country versus Italy and Spain. So Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so <laughs> yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> um, so so uh, they cannot compete at the Prosecco Cava. They have to compete at the Champagne level because they have got similar. Labor costs is, is and utility costs and everything costs the same as in France, if not more so in, in London, but um, not in the southern part, of course, of England. But anyways, to answer your question, they make great wine. And um, what they also make in this country, which is actually the best product in my industry, um, is scotch. Oh, really? We, yeah. uh, we obviously in the fine wine, and we spoke a lot about fine wine today, but uh, our client base um, asked us to help them collect the nicest rare spirits in this world and some of the nicest rare spirits made in this world is made in this country 
or in Scotland. In Scotland, yeah. In, in, in Scotch is fantastic. And some of them go for half a million. Oh, uh, my God. In, so in, it was actually the point that I was going to come on to about wine, but let's go on to Scotch first. I know that there was a big boom, and I'm so sure that pretty much any of our customers that drink were part of that boom in the Japanese, you know, Suntory kind of uh, infatuation with nope. Hibiki and all the different variants of Hibiki. They make a lot of products in, in Japan, yeah. uh, in, 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 but they're particularly known for their, um, for their, for their whiskey, of whiskey course, as, as well. you said. Uh, and it's terrific. And people collect, you know, Japanese whiskey uh, here or in America, everywhere else. Uh, and it, it, it's a really high quality product. Mm. Um, and the, the, biggest, the and Scottish it, is, is the best. Is it in your opinion, would you say? I think it is the best, yeah. What what particular brand would you say stands out above the rest? The, 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 the number one front run runner um, is McCallan. Really? Yeah, they're top of the league. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, they aren't, they and aren't uh, well, where's that entry point where you actually know pure class? Yeah, just like in fine wine, there are whiskey tasters and critics scores and stuff like that. And, you know, the aging, they, they've got so much age to it, right? It's got 15 years, 18, 30 years, 25 years, some of them 40, 50, 70 years. And, um, how, and what cask has been chosen, what bottler chose to actually bottle the whiskey from what cask. And there's so many things that come into play. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's all about either, if you want to make money, you ask someone like us, say, what, what should I buy and why? Or um, if you just like to drink it, you buy it from reputable merchants, just like yeah. us. And there are many other very good you know merchants out there selling scotch and some people just like to spend 100k and open a bottle oh of scotch oh my god <laughs> that's just <laughs> and, nuts, and and right. same for wine you know some people spend you know 50,000 pounds on a bottle of wine and they go and open it so okay you mentioned a um there's bottles of wine from 1920s right yeah. have you ever tasted a bottle from the 1920s no never okay what's the earliest bottle of wine that you've tasted mm. 1970 1970 is the yeah. earliest one, right? Actually, I, I, sorry, 1961. Oh wow! Is the That's oldest crazy. bottle of wine I've ever had? Yes. And and what did it taste like? Forest floor. <laughs> it was supposed to be amazing, <laughs> but I like my wines a bit younger. So uh, <laughs> frankly, I didn't. Uh, I don't know. It, it's you know the wine still. Ex let's say the wine's still alive. And, okay. and the idea behind it is that you try a product that is still so old yet still alive, and it really is. Good. It's just the price is so high. If you ask me, would you like to have something like we're drinking today? I would prefer it. Prefer but it. Yeah. Um, my, my, my answer back then was different than my answer now. But now I would say, yeah, it was a little bit like, it was a bit old. <laughs> 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 but, but 1961 is a phenomenal vintage. So um, Okay. And that, that bottle of wine would have been how much? I think it was like 2K or something like that, 2.5K. Oh, wow. Okay, fine. So what's the most expensive bottle of wine you've ever sold? And then the follow-up question is, what's the most expensive bottle of wine that you've ever drank? Okay. So the, the most expensive bottle of wine I ever sold was uh, 60,000 um, pounds. It was a uh, Le Roi Mussini 2005. Uh, Le Roi is, uh, is, is a terrific, Domaine Le Roi is a terrific um, producer in Burgundy. Pinot Noir, of course. Lady who makes the wine, actually. Um, and... Um, it's a lady who makes the wine. And it was three bottles as well. So it was um, 180K. Um, so that was the most expensive wine uh, we ever sold or I ever sold. Um, and the most, the most expensive bottle of wine I ever had, um, <coughs> I had the chance to try a Romani Conti once. Um, Domaine Romani Conti. Have you seen the Siri Gentleman? It just came out on Netflix. Oh, I, I've, I've seen the uh, adverts. Okay, all right. What about um, it? They consider it to be the best producer in the world. I mean, oh, really? They, they, some of them say that it's the best. Um, uh, say the name again, Domaine? Domaine de la Romani Conti. Okay. DRC is the acronym for it. And uh, in, in that series, we just came out to actually drink it as well. Uh, okay. But they make different wines um, based on the terroir, which is the piece of land, let's say, in, in Burgundy. And they, they have from most expensive to, to least expensive. And I had the, mo the third most expensive one, uh, which would be the Riche Boer. And uh, I had a 2005, uh, which, which would be about, you know, 7K, something like that. Wow. I uh, had it with a friend. Yeah, it was amazing. Was that it was good? really amazing. It's, it's, it's better when you don't think about the price. Yeah. 
But if, if you had it blindly, you and I, if we had it blindly now, you would guarantee tell me that this, this is phenomenal. I believe there's a problem in the wine industry as well where you can end up being duped for fake wines. Is that right? Yeah, it's absolutely correct. Like if in every other industry, there, there is this issue. Um, in, in our industry, there are two ways you can be um, duped. It's, it's, it's one is that you're sold wine which ultimately are not in a good condition anymore. So this, this the, the, to, to bring that to supercars, it would be like someone sells you a supercar which is supposed to have 2,000 miles on it but actually has 150. And, and, and there's a difference, right, in, in the quality of the product. And um, in, in our industry, that's the case. And, and frankly, it happened to us literally yesterday. One no of way. our clients, he calls up, he said, oh, I've got this case of wine. Uh, I bought it elsewhere. I'd like you to help me sell it if possible. And we looked at it. We're like, hold on, the value of your thing here is 25% of what you think it is. And we're definitely not going to be involved with selling it. Why? Because look, just looking at the pictures, we, are, we can already tell that the quality of the wine is, t- is not optimal. It hasn't been stored properly. And so th- there are two areas here. You have to be sure that you buy a product which, even if it's real, it's actually been kept in the right way. Um, and the second is, of course, that the product, the, the juice that's inside the bottle uh, wow. is, is the real juice. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 and that's an ind- it's a problem at the higher end. People will not bother making a fake bottle of t- 20 pounds or 50 pounds. But, you know, when you're talking about 50,000 pounds a bottle, a lot, you know, some people might think about making a fake bottle. And, um, and um, with all the tech in the world today, I'm, I'm assuming that it's probably not very hard to try and replicate the way a bottle should look. Yeah, you, the label and stuff like that. Mm. So, so one of the things is um, they put numbers. So um, there, there's something called back labels. So they actually put back labels in terms of um, what number it is. So they might produce only 5,000 bottles of, bin, of something and you might have number, you know, 248 or whatever it is. And normally what you didn't provide for very rare stuff is you provide an invoice. You don't say, of course, the amount you bought something, but an invoice from the producer saying... I am the buyer and the owner of this particular product with this particular code, and therefore you are now, you know, it's almost like passing on, you know, ownership. Um, and so there are ways around it to make sure that you are careful. But ultimately, it's a problem in our industry, and it is a problem in, 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 in other industries. So how do you um, ensure that the, the, the wine that you're buying yeah. isn't a fake or isn't a... So I get it that you're, you're saying that an invoice, is there any other way? I think ultimately the, the, the number one thing to do is make sure that you buy from reputable merchants, mm. whether it is ourselves, and there are, we have many colleagues in this country and other countries who do a very good job as well, and just making sure you buy from a reputable person. I think when you buy online or from people that you don't know or private individuals who store at home and stuff, you know, maybe it's better to buy from a professional. Mm. Um, and, and the second thing um, you should do is, is if something's too good to be true, then probably you should stay yes. away from it. Um, <laughs> Tell but me about to, it. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but we do do something is that we store the wines in bonds. And in bond means you, ha- you don't have to pay VAT on the product until it exits the in bond warehouse. And in bond warehouses are uh, only HMRC give authority for warehouses to be deemed in bond. And when you store wines in bonds, so when we bring in wines, goods in this country from France, and we install them, there's a lot of paperwork involved, and the government is involved. Why? Because you have a liability to pay taxes yeah. on the products. So when you buy wines in bond from a reputable merchant, someone who's been around like a decade or more like ourselves, we've never bought a wine. We've never, in the history of our company, we've never had one single complaint about it. So anyone saying us that it, it wasn't wow. as good is what the real thing is. We've never, I've never heard of any of my customers ever wow. having bought fake wine. So, 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 in many of my other competitors in this country do a very good job, and there are many of them who, 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 who are respectable merchants. And so, uh, uh, naturally, my, my answer to your question would be just buy it from, you know, a professional company, just like buying a supercar from a professional dealer. You mentioned a few times about investment, right? Now and. You know, like I was mentioning to you, the Enzo, let's say, for example, that we that is right behind you, maybe four years ago or five years ago, might have been around 1.5, 1.6 mil. And now is around, you know, definitely over 3.1, 3.2 million pounds, right? Um, 
such a rare car. Uh, so anybody that would have invested around that time is laughing, right? Yeah. Um, this isn't a anomaly. There's many different cars uh, that if you picked right, you would have made a lot of money. And there's, you know, things like, let's say, for example, the Bugatti Veyron is, is right now between anywhere between 1.2, 1.4 mil. Um, that is a car that I personally feel quite strongly about that I think over the next five to seven years will at least, at the very least, be worth five mil. Just purely because they're not making them anymore. And the best thing I find about cars, which doesn't compare to uh, art, is the fact that whilst it is a work of art, uh, you can drive, you can enjoy, right? And still appreciate in value. Um, what would your views be on wine, you know, as an investment class, as, as a way to diversify your portfolio? Yeah. I think um, it's, it's similar to what you just said uh, about the Enzo here or, or the Bugatti Veyron. It's been made. You can't make it again. The vintage has been made. You cannot, you, you'll never go back in time and make more of it. So the supply, is, that's it. came out, it's fixed. Um, now, you do have to select carefully. You cannot just buy anything, of course. But in terms of overall as a sort of diversification tool for any serious investor, um, if we go a, a tiny bit technical, let's say, on the subject, um, fine wine is, is an asset class which is uncorrelated to mainstream investments, such as shares or bonds. And so, i.e., if the shares, equities, like we saw not too long ago, are, like, dumping, yeah, it doesn't mean that wine is dumping necessarily. Correct. If, if anything it's actually so uncorrelated that it is a good diversification asset. Oh, wow. And, and if you speak to one of our um, investment specialists, that is ultimately what they will bring forward, is that your risk-adjusted return, so the volatility of your portfolio, uh, improves just like gold as soon as you, you add it to any portfolio. Oh, so wow. Just like gold, you should always hold some of it if you invest into shares and bonds and fine wine um, and, and we're quite big in getting people on board in the team who have you know serious financial backgrounds at Goldman Sachs and all these other places and, um, and, and they all come on board because they see how powerful fine wine is when you include it into a portfolio of, of various different other assets so, so as an asset class it's, it's, it's terrific it really does the job it improves the risk of just return of your portfolio now how much 5-10% to 10 is probably what you should be doing um, and then how that's when you partner with a company like ours. You can try to do it yourself, but it's so much work, so much research. And, and, and you have to build a whole logistics infrastructure. I mean, and, and it's just not worth it. So if you believe in it, which we obviously do, we, we, you should always partner up with, with a professional company if you decide to go about doing it. Restaurants in London now are letting you store wine, yeah. some, some wine there, so that you can go and eat and then call up your bottle of wine, yeah, yeah. right? That's Terrific. quite a cool concept, right? So cool. I love yeah. it. Yeah, and ultimately, <laughs> it's a product to be enjoyed. Yeah. And that's the fun thing about it. A lot of people buy five cases, and then five years later, they say, right, I'm going to sell those three, and then with the profits I make, I'm going to drink the other two, you know? Oh. <laughs> and uh, we, I love I doing like that. that, and that's what I do all this <laughs> time, too. But, oh, yeah. And how about your own collection, then? Yeah. Do you, do you have a big yeah. collection of for yourself? Yeah, I collect seriously. Um, I love really? it. Uh, yeah, for, for investment purposes, but also because I just love wine. Yeah. And um, How many w uh, bottles of wine would you say you've got in your own collection? Probably more than I should. Don't tell my <laughs> wife. <laughs> but yeah, uh, definitely over the thousand. Oh, wow. So There's it, a um, video that's gone viral on TikTok. Uh, a sommelier opening a bottle of wine in a very unconventional way. What's your thoughts on that? So uh, I, I've personally never done that before, but I have heard about it a few times. And essentially, it's the fact where you look at the bottle and you think, all right, that cork is, is, is so old or it's not in a good condition. What I'm going to do is I'm going to skip the process of taking out the cork and I'm just going to take off the head. Wow. And, uh, is that the reason why? Yeah. And because so essentially, if, if a bottle of wine is old enough, then the chances are that the second that you put the corkscrew in, it's just going to yeah, disintegrate. It crumbles. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. 
But that doesn't necessarily mean that the wine's gone bad. Correct. Okay, fine. Um, and I've opened many wines where uh, you know it crumbles apart and falls inside the wine, and then you kind of distill. I it. thought it was just me, by the way. Until <laughs> 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 you find out, lots of other people do as well. Um, um, but in this circumstance, what they they just skipped the whole cork oh, wow. um, pulling process, and they cut off the head. And in order to do that, um, you have this device which they use uh, as in the video, and and you essentially burn almost with you, you heat it up so so much that you burn the head off and then you pull it off it, it's quite a unique way of of doing it but that's what what they're doing in the video it's I, very cool. I would be so nervous that i'm gonna ha- be swallowing some shards of glass that are gonna exactly that's what i rip up my intestines yeah. <laughs> when i go to sleep at night no yeah, no, I, I, I don't know if I would <laughs> drink from it either, but obviously the bottle was so special that they, they thought it was the right thing to do. They thought it was the right thing to do. But I've also seen that on champagne bottles with the swords, right? Oh, yeah, that's great. I do it all the time. Do you? I love it. Yeah. Okay. I'll show you one day. All uh, right. So uh, we can share with the audience the, the trick. The trick is that actually the way a, a bottle of wine is, is, is made, uh, or bottle of champagne, is that it's two sides which are almost glued together. Okay, yeah, got That's it. the way to look at it. And if you th- if you look at it, there will be a very thin yeah, yeah, line where yeah. you can see the actual two uh, parts being put together. And if you put your your sword or your knife or whatever device you have, actually you can do it with the bottom of a glass of wine. No, as well. you can't. Yeah, yeah, I can wow. do it. And then you just do it with the bottom. It has to be very cold. The bottle of champagne. You can just pop it out like that, and it pops out. It's amazing. It's cool. I do it all the time. <laughs> that is brilliant. I think brilliant. it's fun, but obviously you have to be careful where you shoot it. <laughs> well, you have to be careful where you shoot. But again, does the glass not? No, it doesn't. I never, and, and I've, I've done it, you know, 20 plus times. Oh, wow. Never encountered it. I never even heard of a story where someone had glass in their mouth. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna so if to you want to have a cool party trick, there you go. I, do you know what? I might try it with like a five pound bottle of Prosecco first. And oh, then right. uh, <laughs> tell me how it goes. <laughs> What's the most extravagant slash valuable collection that you've ever seen of wine? The biggest collection of wine I ever came across. And I saw the list in... Um, I was able to buy some wines from it. Uh, it was 60 million uh, euros, actually. It was in the euros. 60 million euros. That's and it, unbelievable. And this person had amassed 60 million euros of wine over a long time. Uh, but, uh, but they had 60 million euros of wine. Yeah. Unbelievable list. And I mean, you know, you have to imagine this is wine, which even if you drink a bottle every day, you can finish it. I mean... Um, and so... 60 million pounds were, uh, euros worth of wine. He's sitting on it. But I'm guessing every day it's going up in value. Oh, yeah. He probably bought it for... I mean, he, he was someone who knew a long time ago which wines to buy. Uh, he didn't tell me how much he bought it for, but I wouldn't be surprised if he bought it for 20 and, 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 he, and he tripled no his money. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> it's great for him. A great, you know, and 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 ultimately, yeah, it probably was more today because it was three years ago. I think my problem is I'd keep on dipping into the stash, yeah, right. you know. I know that's why you ne- have to ne- keep your stash with the in the warehouse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll that's keep it with you. Yeah, yeah. He was dipping in his own supply, but oh. which, which you should, right? Which if you, you got should. Sixty million dollars of wine. I mean, go enjoy it. I, but I, I almost feel that with cars as well. You know, we we get a lot of people that will buy you know, million pound plus cars. Yeah. And they won't drive it. And they'll, you know, they'll offer it to us. Yeah. And it will, after five years of ownership, only have a thousand miles on it. Yeah. And you're like, that's one of the greatest cars ever made. And you've only driven it a couple of hundred miles every year. Yeah. Now get it, the, the, the value is retained but on the same token, I don't know if I'd have the, the will to just say, nope, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to touch that car. I'm not going to drive yeah. it, whatever. No, I'm 100% with you on this subject. I, I, I think, you know, we have what we call collectors, people who really enjoy a good deal, making money from buying wines, but at the same time, occasionally opening up, a, a, you know, a few of them. And, and I, th- I think that's, and also ultimately, you know, that's what the product is. The product is made to ultimately be enjoyed by someone. The cars as well. It's ultimately made for someone to drive at some point. You know the saying YOLO, right? Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think in one sentence, that sentences it, yeah. I, see, I'd be doing... I mean, right now, I'm in the proper mood for YOLO. So I'd be opening up crazy... <laughs> crazy Good bottles of wine. the collection is not here, yeah. Yeah. 
So I've I've heard of watches going for you know five million, ten million, or whatever it is, and cars just go nuts, right? There was the two hundred and fifty GTO Ferrari that that I think it was like twenty five mil wow. euros not too long ago. Um, but in your knowledge, yeah. what, what's the most expensive bottle of wine that's ever been sold on the market? Um, recently, we had a um, um, at auction uh, a bottle of. DRC, de Mendler, Romain okay, Conti, we talked about earlier. Yeah. Uh, their top um, wine that they make is called La Romain Conti. And the vintage was 1945, which is obviously the end of the war, but also it happens to be an exceptional vintage. Uh, and that bottle went for half a million dollars. One bottle. Now, typically, I'd be like, oh my God, that's so much money. But on the same token, I guess the person that's buying that isn't probably going to drink it, right? Would you say that that is, is some is something it's memorabilia, right? Yeah. In the same way that um, you know somebody might have a piece of art on their wall, this is yeah. one of from the the most important wine house yeah. in the world. Yeah. And you know, from such an important time in history. Yeah. Then, to be honest with you, it kind of makes sense, no? I agree with you uh, in terms of they don't always drink them. Sometimes they look at it as a piece of art. So last weekend I was in the house of a client who has become a, a friend of mine now. And uh, he had every single beautiful bottle you can imagine. I mean, an estate, the estate was, was you know, so stunning. Um, and naturally what you do is you then show your friends, let's have a look at my wine cellar. And you show the bottles and obviously with all the technology that they all put in the right places and with the lighting. I mean, it was just stunning to see. Probably one of the nicest ones I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, and, and obviously they put forward some bottles they've been able to collect over the years, which are very special, which might not necessarily be drunk, but it's almost like a piece of art that they want to show their friends. But half a million dollars for a bottle of wine is... Is a lot of money. Yeah. And I, bet, and I bet you came down... Back then it probably came out at, at you know, 10 quid or something. 10 quid. <laughs> what is the fascination with Petrus? Because that's the one that you see, you know, even with the new age Instagram kind of, I want to show off yeah. what I'm spending my money on. You see the, I've just spent X amount 5K of thousand. on Petrus, yeah. Right. I've gone to this restaurant. I've just spent 5K on Petrus. Why is that brand and yeah. that bottle of wine so bloody expensive? Yeah, it's a Bordeaux wine. It's a right bank wine it's from Pomerol. Um, it, it, is, it is just amazing. Really, uh, it, it, I've I've had it, of course, and and uh, many other wine collectors would have tried it, at, but yeah, it is pretty pretty expensive. Um, you've you've got a few wines in that right bank region, so you spoke about Saint Emilion and Pomerol as well, but you have La Fleur and Le Pain, and some people would say, oh, this is the Lamborghini of wines, and that one is the Ferrari of wines, and that one is the Maserati of wines, or whatever. And yeah, pa- Petrus is considered to be one of the best. Right bank, or if not one of the best wines made in the world, and it is really amazing. Really, but you have to put down five thousand pounds or three thousand pounds for younger vintages. Every sip to try. It's it. like two hundred pounds. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you think like that, yeah, sure. No, I don't know how I'd be able to drink that, but um, you know, um, with a car, let's say the difference between a Ferrari F four thirty and a four five eight was so substantial. It's like going analog versus, you know, digital. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the price differential was definitely justified, right? But then you go from the 458 to the 488. And, yeah, the, the difference is good, but it's incrementally, you know, not as much as the 430 to the 458. And then 488 to the F8 is, you know, like this much. And then each time it goes up, it's going smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Law of diminishing returns, yeah. right? So the wines that we drunk today, in my mind, are fantastic. Yeah. So I just, and, and so they're so, um, so much better than your 20 pound bottle of wine. Yeah. That I'm just trying to work out how much better can a bottle of Petrus five thousand pounds be compared to something like this? Yeah. Is it is it incrementally much yeah. lower? Yeah. It, does that make sense? It makes perfect sense and absolutely it's true. It's not that you have a ten times better experience. It's just that 
in, in, in this level of ex- perfection to just be a tiny bit more perfect than someone else cre- it's so difficult that the more you perfect get, the quicker the price goes up because there's only just a few bottles left in the world which might be better than the one you had. And there's also just a lot of people in the last 20 years, as you know, who got rich and who want to buy nice things. And yeah. demand has outstripped supply. Really? And, uh, and therefore, people are willing to pay a lot of money to have a bottle of wine nowadays. Wow. Um, and, uh, but you're right in saying it's not, it does, it's, it's not 10 times better. No. Uh, but, but these have been carefully selected by us because we love these wines. And for, this, for, the, mon- for the money we pay, which of course is not cheap, th- these are great bottles of wine. This part of the podcast is a quick fire round. I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions. Answer them as quick as possible. So what's the strangest scenario that you've ever found yourself in? Drinking, uh, shotting really nice wines in Singapore. By, because I was with a client and he was just, his, his view was we would just chuck these wines and I was trying to enjoy them and I was just going one after the other and it was a bit strange because we got drunk in the space of half an hour and well, I thought I was going to have a really nice dinner. Did you have to play any games with dice and stuff like that down there in Singapore? Uh, no, I didn't go down the dice route. No? no? Okay, I did. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, your favourite wine and how much does it retail for? My favourite wine is the Mouton Rothschild 2004 because that's the one that I tried when I was young that gave me the love of wine, as I said. Uh, and it retails for probably £500. One unique skill that you possess that nobody knows about? I guess I have a special ability to remember things, which, which applies to business too. But for wine, um, it's the ability to remember how I, the, the, how I try the wine. Uh, so I got an ar- ar- aromatic memory, if you can call it that way. That's so so cool. um, the other day, my colleague here, she was uh, describing how she tried a wine and what aromas she had. And before she, she could explain to me what wine it was, I said, well, it's that wine. And I was right. And wow. I th- I, so, so I, I never thought I had that skill until I, over the years I started to smell wine and know quite quickly what it was. But by the way, you know when um, the flavours that you pick in a wine, that, that, that come across in a wine, that's because of the soil that they're grown on, right? Yes. So that if, if there's that type of fruit or... Uh, am I right in saying that? Yeah, if, if, there's, uh, if, if that type of produce is being grown nearby or something like yeah, that. You're absolutely right. So in, in Burgundy, um, you, you, they use the grape Pinot Noir. And just a neighbor will make the same, we use the same grape in the same uh, climate, of course, maybe a tiny bit different if an angle on, on, on the mountain. But, um, but it will taste different. And, and it's often the soil that talks. So the French call that terroir, which is the fancy word that they use. And the terroir is essentially the soil. So the soil talks to you, and that's what you try later. That's why the soil, just 300 meters apart, can be 10 times more valuable. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sorry, how many meters apart? You can be 300 meters away, and your soil can be 10 times more valuable. No than your neighbor way. In, that's in certain crazy. areas, yeah. What's your favorite way to unwind after work? I play tennis, ah. but, but followed by a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, tennis is my, my <laughs> unwinding. Hardest decision that you've ever had to make in business? I mean, like everyone else, it's firing people. It's never easy. You, you, you get on with people. You, you, you build relationships. You, you go through, through years of stuff and, you know, you have to let them go. It's never easy. It's never pleasant. But ultimately, it's your job when you're a CEO is you have to, you know, grow a company. If you don't, your competitors will outgrow you and then you'll let everyone go. So, yeah, it's, it's the most unpleasant thing there is. But you have to make them, you have to make them, and you have to make them well every single time. I couldn't agree more. Um, and best region for wine? Bordeaux. That's my favorite. It's got everything. It's got the wines and it's got the history. So it's got the chateaus. And if you've never been, you have to go. Really? Uh, I've never it's, been. Uh, it's, it's magnificent. You go there in May, June. The weather's stunning. The restaurants are good. You go and really? have dinner in the chateaus. You sleep oh. in the chateaus. You go jumping in their pools. You wake your day up. You have great wines for lunch. It's, it's beautiful. Not only for the wines, but also for the, the history, let's say, of the region. It's, it's, it's absolutely stunning. It's my favorite region. Wow. Uh, and I, I go there maybe three, four times a year, and every time I love it. You're going to have to give me some advice, because yeah, I, I yeah, definitely want to well, go. We'll go with better halves. Um, and one final question. What's one piece of advice that you'll give to our audience? 
ultimately, I think the, the, the advice I would give is wine is, is ultimately something that uh, is personal and never feel the public social pressure of having to know, let's say, um, what wines you should choose or how wine should taste. You should just always just buy whatever you like and, 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 and describe a wine whatever way you think it is described. And if you stick to your first instinct, it's actually in our industry what they say, it's always truth. But, but wine is a product that's meant to be enjoyed and, you know, open the bottles and have fun with your friends and, 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 and don't take it too serious. Uh, a lot of people get scared of fine wine because they think it's a very serious subject and they should know more about it than everyone else. But Ultimately, it's just a wonderful thing to enjoy as people. So maybe don't don't take it too serious. But if you want to do it seriously, I guess partner up with a professional company. But yeah, that would be my advice. Some good advice. I I really enjoyed these bottles of wine. I think I might have enjoyed them too much. <laughs> you know, I have to get a lift home if if one of you boys can drop me off. Um, but uh, that was great. Thank you. Thank you for having for me. Joining it was us. really great. It's yeah. good fun. Yeah, really appreciate it. So guys, we learned so much about the wine industry today and what a great guest we had on the show today. If you like this episode, please don't forget to like, subscribe and share and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Until next time, see you later. Bye.